But I came here uh, with this talk, More Than Myth, Can Genesis Be Harmonized with Science? Now, at Reasons to Believe, our team of scientists and theologians, we do a lot of debates with atheists and skeptics. But something we've noticed when we debate the academic uh, skeptics is their response. Uh, for example, my colleague, Fazal Rana, he's our staff biochemist. He debated Michael Roos at the University of California, Riverside, on the subject of the origin of life. And when Michael Roos had his opportunity to rebut Fuzz's uh, arguments for why the origin of life must be supernatural, I noticed that Michael totally ignored everything Fuzz had to say. Instead, he went straight to Genesis 1 and tried to turn the debate into whether or not Genesis 1 was scientifically credible. Now, some of you may recognize this fellow, uh, Michael Shermer. He's been here to Austin. He's the executive director of the Skeptic Society. And, you know, I pastor in a church that's just a few miles from the headquarters of the Skeptic Society. We get atheists coming to uh, the class I teach on a regular basis. And I've debated him many times. And it doesn't matter what I debate with Michael Shermer, whatever the subject is, he always goes straight to Genesis 1. So, for example, Fazrana and I debated him at the University of Texas right here in Austin. Over 3,000 people showed up for the debate. And Michael Shermer's job was to respond to the presentations Fuzz and I gave on the scientific evidence for the God of the Bible. He ignored everything we said and spent his entire 30 minutes bashing Genesis chapter 1. Okay. And this has happened every time a debate of Michael. Doesn't matter what the debate topic is, he always goes straight for Genesis 1. Now, why do leading atheists, professional atheists, do this? It's because they see Genesis 1 as the Achilles heel of the Christian faith. Their object is to destroy the faith that people have in God's Word. And they see Genesis 1 as the most effective way to do that. In fact, these atheists and skeptics have been so effective in using Genesis 1 as a weapon that they've intimidated the Christian community. Now, I speak a lot in front of pastors, but what I find out is that most pastors will not touch the first 11 chapters of Genesis. They avoid it because they're trying to avoid these attacks from skeptics and atheists. However, many theologians still teach on Genesis 1, but as I speak on seminary campuses, what I'm noticing is that theology professors are now taking this approach, where they say, yes, we will teach on Genesis 1, but for example, I have this quote. We need to understand that Genesis 1 is saying nothing about creation or science. Genesis 1 ought not to be taken as a literal historical account of all material reality. And that's how they're responding to these skeptics. They say, wait a minute, you're saying that Genesis 1 is scientific nonsense, but we're telling you there is no science in Genesis 1. There is no creation in Genesis 1. This is not a chronology. It's an allegory or a figure of speech. However, if you take a Bible and open it up to the first page and show it to someone who's really never been exposed to the Bible before and say, what do you think of this? It screams that it's an historical account of natural history. I mean, look at the great ends the author of Genesis 1 went to. The days are numbered. It uses the phrase, and it was so. It's like, if you know anything about the Hebrew language, Moses couldn't have gone any further to communicate with great clarity that this indeed is an account of creation history. And by the way, things are happening at the seminary level where I see theologians saying, we need to change the lexicons. The word bara does not mean create. The word asa does not mean make. For 19 centuries, the dictionaries have been wrong. All an attempt to try to respond to these atheists and skeptics who are saying Genesis 1 is nothing but scientific nonsense. Now, I speak a lot in Genesis 1. I've written books on Genesis 1 and in the other early chapters of Genesis. People have asked me, why do you do this when this is such a thorn uh, and such a problem with these atheists and skeptics? Well, for me personally, I, did not, I was not raised in a Christian home. 
In fact, I really didn't get to know Christians to any degree until eight years after I became a Christian. But it was Genesis 1 that was a turning point for me in recognizing that the Bible indeed was the error-free word. It's the first thing I read in the Bible. And I came to a very different conclusion than these atheists and skeptics. Now, what I'm going to show you is how you can read Genesis 1 without any hermeneutical gymnastics and show that this indeed must be the inspired, inerrant Word of God. So that's my goal here in these next few minutes, to transform Genesis 1 from Christianity's Achilles heel, our so-called greatest weakness, into one of the strongest reasons to believe the Bible is the inspired, inerrant Word of God. And we're going to do this through applying the scientific method to the text. And they said, why are you doing that? Well, the first time I picked up a Bible and began to go through Genesis 1, I saw the scientific method. Now, I had been trained and educated in Canada. I was raised in the public education system. I was taught the scientific method in grade 1, grade 2, grade 3. We got it every single year. But none of my public school teachers told me where the scientific method came from. When I first looked at Genesis 1, the scientific method leapt off the page. As I looked at the other creation texts in the Bible, and there's over two dozen of them, they all follow the scientific method, which caused me to do some historical reading, and I recognized that the scientific method was derived from the Bible. That's where it came from. So I prefer to call it the biblical testing method. What attracted me about the Bible was the only holy book that I had picked up that commanded objective testing. The Apostle Paul in Thessalonians says it this way, test everything, hold fast to that which is good. But the Bible not only commanded objective testing, it showed you step by step how to put everything to the test. And that was the birth of the scientific method. What happened in the Reformation, ordinary people, not just the pastors, began to read the Bible for themselves. And those with a scientific bent saw this biblical testing method. They applied it to their scientific research, and that was the birth of the scientific revolution. It's no accident that the scientific revolution exploded out of Reformation Europe. It's right there in the Bible. Now, I'm going to go through this fairly quickly because I'm hoping to leave a little bit of time uh, for Q&A uh, after I'm done. Uh, and you're going to think, wow, in fact, Richard Land was saying this is kind of like looking, drinking out of a fire hose. I'm going to give this to you quickly, but the statements I'm making are all backed up by full-length books, and I'll refer to them uh, briefly as we go through this. So there will be, if you want to go through this slowly and absorb it, we have resources to make that possible. So with that, let me just jump into it. Genesis 1.1, probably the best-known verse in the whole world. As I travel and speak around the world, I run into people who have never heard of John 3.16, but everybody's heard of Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, in the debates I've had with Michael Shermer, he says, the Bible gets it wrong from the very first verse. It says the heavens and the earth are created at the same time. What he doesn't realize is that in Hebrew, there is no word for universe. Instead, you got this phrase, Shamayana rests with a definite article. Whenever you see in the Bible, the heavens and the earth, it's referring to the totality of physical reality. It's used nine times in the Old Testament, but it always means the totality of physical reality. All matter, all energy, and all space and time. And the word bara, translated create, means to bring into existence something brand new that never existed before. And this is repeated many times as you go through the creation texts in the Bible, that the whole universe has a beginning, not just a beginning of matter and energy, but the beginning of space and time itself. Now, I'm well aware that within the church there's a lot of controversy on how to interpret these creation texts. Let me give you a key. 2 Thessalonians, or, yeah, 1, 9. Pardon me, 2 Timothy 1, 9. The grace of God that we now experience was put into effect before the beginning of time. Titus 1-2, the hope that we share in Jesus Christ was given to us before the beginning of time. Every major creation text in the Bible, all two dozen of them, always link the doctrine of creation with the doctrine of redemption. 
God's works of redemption precede his works of creation. Before God created the universe, he was already putting into effect his works of redemption. The key to interpreting these creation texts is to always put it in the context of redemption. Or to put it another way, everything God creates is for the purpose of redeeming billions of human beings. You get that in Revelation 7, 9, that the hosts that will be standing before the Lord, the redeemed hosts, will be countless. The Greeks could count up to a billion. Countless means there's billions that will be redeemed. And there's a reason why God designed the universe so that our planet would be able to sustain billions of human beings at one time. He wants to redeem a large number of us. And so this is how I think we should go through the different creation texts of the Bible, interpret it in the context of redemption. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, I was reading this as a teenager when physicists in Britain were developing the first of the space-time theorems. I won't go into those theorems. There's about 30 of them today. But the latest of the theorems, published just a few years ago, makes the point that if the universe contains mass, and I'll be talking about this in a little more detail tomorrow, every one of you is living proof that the universe contains mass. And if the universe is governed by the equations of general relativity, today general relativity ranks as the most exhaustively tested and best proven principle in all of physics. Some of you are probably aware of the discovery of gravity waves about five weeks ago. There is no theory that's been better proven which means that the theorems based on general relativity and the universe containing mass must be true. What do those theorems state? That there must be a causal agent beyond space and time that created the entire universe. Because of these space-time theorems, we know that a God that transcends space and time is responsible for bringing everything into existence. Now, this is not just something that's acknowledged by those of us in astronomy and physics that are Bible-believing Christians. It's also acknowledged by the very physicists that produce these theorems. So, for example, Alexander Vilenkin, one of the three authors of the latest of these theorems, wrote this in a book about a year after. He said, quote, with the proof now in place, cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. There is no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. And what is that problem? Proof of a space-time beginning implies a causal agent beyond space and time who created our universe of space, time, matter, and energy. Which means a miracle-working God must exist. We get all that from the very first sentence of the Bible. Great place to start with any skeptic. And this is something I've written about extensively in this book, Why the Universe is the Way It Is. And this is an outline of what I'm going to cover in the remainder of my talk. This basically says as we move from Genesis 1-1 into the six days of creation, we need to first deal with step one of the biblical testing method. Step one is do not interpret until you establish the point of view or the frame of reference. And it was Galileo who said the biggest mistake you can make in Bible interpretation is to get the wrong frame of reference or the wrong point of view. So we're going to look at that. We're going to look at the definitions for the different words because after all, this is a text written in Hebrew. Hebrew has a very tiny vocabulary and virtually every Hebrew noun has multiple literal definitions. Notice that when Christians debate these creation texts, they're basically English language speakers. In English, we have four million words in our language. It's an enormous vocabulary. Biblical Hebrew, if you don't count the names of people and cities, is just 3,000 words. So anyway, we'll get into that, and then we're going to examine how accurately does the Genesis 1 text describe the order of events and the description of the events. So let's begin with the first one. What we need to notice here is that the frame of reference changes from the universe as a whole, Genesis 1-1, to the surface of the earth. Genesis 1-2, the Spirit of God is hovering over the surface of the waters of planet earth. 
That's the frame of reference from which we're to interpret the six days of creation. When skeptics and atheists say that Genesis 1 teaches scientific nonsense, it's because they have the point of view above the earth, as if God is looking down on the earth and telling us what he did. I would agree with them. If that is the point of view, Genesis 1 is teaching 100% scientific nonsense. And this would be proof that the Bible could not be the inspired, inerrant word of God. But they got the wrong frame of reference. If you have the frame of reference on the surface of the earth, it transforms, as you'll see in a few minutes, Genesis 1 from scientific nonsense and one of the most powerful arguments we have that the Bible is the inspired, authoritative, inerrant Word of God. So if you remember nothing else from my talk today, I want you to remember that the point of view for Genesis 1 is the surface of the waters of the earth, below the cloud layer, not above the cloud layer, on the surface of the waters. Now step two of the biblical testing method is to establish the starting conditions. But before I go there, I want to deal with the elephant in the room. What do you do with this word yom that's translated day? I mean, as I'm sure many of you are aware, there's a raging debate. Are these creation days six consecutive 24-hour periods, or are they six consecutive longer periods of time? I wasn't even aware of that debate when I first picked up a Bible. That's one thing I did recognize. Just looking at the first page of the Bible, this word day must have at least three distinct definitions. Why? Creation day one, it contrasts days and nights. That's day referring to the daylight hours. Creation day four, it contrasts seasons, days, and years. That's day as 24 hours. And Genesis 2-4 uses the word day to refer to the entirety of creation history. That's day being used for a long but finite period of time. Now, if you actually pick up a Hebrew lexicon, you discover that it has these four distinct definitions. Part of the daylight hours, all the daylight hours, a 24-hour period, but a long but finite period of time. And in English, we have over a dozen different words for an epoch of time. In biblical Hebrew, the only word you've got uh, for an epoch of time is this word yom. It's the only biblical word that can be uh, used for a long but finite period of time. Now, when I was 17, reading the Bible uh, for the first time, what I noticed was that you got an evening and a morning bracketing the first six creation days, which told me each one had a start point and an end point. I was expecting to find an evening and a morning for the seventh day, but I didn't find it. It's not there in the text. I said, well, maybe we're still in the seventh day. Now, a little bit about my story. Uh, I became addicted to astronomy and physics when I was about seven years of age. That's when I was bringing about five books home from the Vancouver Public Library and taking another five the next week. And my parents became concerned about my addiction. So when I was about nine and a half, ten years of age, they bought me this really thick book on evolutionary biology. And I was the only one in my family that read it. But after I read it, I said to my mother and father, Mom and Dad, the numbers don't add up. We have all the speciation before humanity and very little after humanity. And that bothered me ever since I was nine and a half years of age. And it wasn't until I was 17 that that enigma got resolved. And it got resolved by reading Genesis 1. For six days, God creates. That explains all the speciation before humanity. On the seventh day, God stops creating. That explains why we're not seeing it in the present era. And what is God during, doing during the seventh day? He's redeeming billions of human beings. During the six days, he sets up all the resources that are going to be needed for billions of human beings to be redeemed. But at the end of the sixth day, he stops his physical creation. And then on the seventh day, there's going to be the redemption. And by the way, the seventh day will end. We hear about that in Romans chapter 8, how there will come a time when the full number of human beings that God intends to redeem will be redeemed, then the universe will have fulfilled its purpose, and God will replace this universe with all of its physics, 
with all of its 200 billion plus galaxies with a brand new realm, the new creation we see in Genesis, uh, pardon me, in Revelation 21 and 22. But hey, if you want to look at 21 more biblical reasons why these creation days must be long periods of time, you can check out my latest book, A Matter of Days. Step two of the biblical testing method, do not interpret and you also establish the starting conditions. And notice that Genesis 1 tells us, in addition to the point of view that is dark on the surface of the waters, that the water covers the whole surface of the earth, there are no continents, and the world is formless and void. In what context? Well, the six days are talking about life. It's saying it's empty of life and it's unfit for life, but now the Spirit of God begins to perform His miracles. Now, this is certainly implied in Genesis 1-2. It's explicit in a parallel account. And what's wonderful about the Bible, it's not just one book, it's 66 books. And there's three other texts in the Old Testament that also take you through the six days of creation. Psalm 104, Proverbs 8, and Job 37, 38, and 39. And I encourage everyone, in terms of trying to resolve divisions within the church, at least look at those four different texts. What you'll see in Job 38, when it refers to creation day one, and what's going on before creation day one, God speaks and he says, I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness. The reason why it's dark is not because of the lack of light in the universe, it's dark because God had wrapped the oceans with clouds that kept the light of the universe from reaching the surface of the earth. Now this is clarified when you look at creation day one. What does it say in creation day one? Let there be light. It uses the verb hayah. It does not use the word for create or make. God did not create life on day one or make life on day one. He let the light be because he already created it when he created the universe. That was Genesis 1.1. But light reaches the surface of the earth for the first time on creation day one. This is when God transforms our atmosphere from being opaque to translucent. And as an astronomer, I can tell you, the primordial earth began with an atmosphere a hundred times thicker than the atmosphere we have today. And that atmosphere indeed would not let any light get through but God transformed the atmosphere. So now it's translucent. Light can reach the surface of the earth, but it's overcast. And that's creation day one. Creation day two, it says, let there be water above and water below. Now on seminary campuses, this is a huge subject of debate. Is the text speaking like the Babylonians talked about, a kind of a metal sphere over the earth with holes in it that water leaks through with stars painted on it? That's what the Babylonians believed. And a lot of people try to pin that on the biblical text. Notice it's just one sentence. But if you go to Job 37 and the first half of Job 38, that chapter and a half is all about creation day two. So instead of getting stuck here with a single sentence in Genesis 1, you can go to the book of Job and you've got a chapter and a half. And what do you see in that chapter and a half? It goes into great detail about how God set up this wonderfully designed water cycle with multiple kinds of liquid precipitation and multiple kinds of frozen precipitation. Now these are six that are mentioned. The Job text actually mentions more. But what I find significant about the different kinds of precipitation is talked about in the book of Job, we need each one for advanced civilization to be possible on planet Earth. We need each one in order for billions of human beings to be redeemed through the work of Jesus Christ. So when you celebrate Thanksgiving, you might want to thank God for the fact that you gave us a planet where we got hail, uh, where we have snow and uh, where we've got, uh, you know, frost and mist and dew and all the other forms of precipitation. And so back to creation day two, water in the atmosphere above and water in the seas and rivers and lakes below where it cycles through so we can have all these forms of precipitation that allow us to have global high technology civilization. Now, if you want a resource that takes you through this in detail, 
you can get our DVD, Journey Toward Creation. This is a television documentary we produced a few years ago where basically I act as a travel uh, guide taking you on a journey from the surface of the earth to the very farthest reaches of the universe. And what's wonderful about that journey, you're going back in time. Because the farther away we astronomers look, the farther back in time we see, and we actually have telescopes so powerful we can take you back to the cosmic creation event itself. That's why we call it Journey Toward Creation. But in this DVD, we show you the miracle of Creation Day 1 and Creation Day 2. And this edition that you'll see out on the table, it's now available in 11 languages, and it's been shown on television in five different countries of the world, including uh, Mongolia and Russia and China. And we even broadcast it into Iran uh, in the Farsi language. Creation Day 3, let there be land masses. And this is when the text talks about God transforming the water world Earth, where all you have is water on the surface, to a planet where you've got oceans and continents coexisting with one another. Now, I happen to be educated at a time when plate tectonics was an emerging science. Matter of fact, I got to take a geophysics course when two of the three geophysicists who launched the discipline of a plate tectonics. But it's advanced to such a degree today that we now can calculate in great detail the growth of the continental land masses with respect to time. And so we're able to demonstrate that the Bible indeed got it right. Our Earth started off with no land at all. And then volcanic activity produced a few small islands, then the plate tectonics kicked in, and you began to see continents being built up. But as you look at this graph here, I want you to see that time when the continents were being most aggressively built up. Basically, a little less than half the Earth's current age. Where does Genesis 1 put it? The first part of creation day three. So notice, Genesis times it the same way that our geophysicists have now determined is the history of the growth of the continental land masses. Creation Day 3, Part 2, let there be plants on these new continents. Let the land produce vegetation. Now, I remember when we were at the University of Texas uh, with Michael Shermer, he made a statement, knowing that Fuzz and I would have no opportunity to respond, where he says, Genesis 1 gets it dead wrong. It puts plants on the continents before animals show up in the oceans. The fossil record has it the opposite way. And I talked to many of the atheists and skeptics who were part of the audience afterwards and said, well, of course, animals have bones and shells. Their fossil records, their fossil remains are going to last a long time. Plants do not. They're going to decay and we're not going to have that remaining evidence beyond more than a few hundred million years. But what has happened since that time is that papers have been published. This one by Noth and Kennedy, which basically makes the point we can't find the fossils, but we can find the isotope evidence that shows us that plants were just as abundant on the continents for 200 million years previous to the first appearance of animals and the 200 million years thereafter. Then two years after that, a second paper got published where they said, we found the actual fossils of these ancient plants. A bit of an overstatement, what they found were fossil parts. The biggest part they found was one millimeter in diameter. But it was sufficient that they could now conclude that plants were abundant on the continents for 600 million years before the Cambrian explosion of animals showing up in the seas. So this is an example where, again, as it says in Job and Psalms, the more we study the book of nature, the more evidence we find for the handiwork of God, the supernatural handiwork of God. Creation day four, it says, let there be the great lights. Once again, it doesn't use the word for create or make. It says, let there be the great lights. And basically it says, why? Let there be the great lights so they may serve as signs to mark seasons, days, and years. Now, when I was reading this at age 17, I said, for whose benefit? And what you recognize is all the life after day four is critically dependent on knowing the positions of the sun, moon, and stars to regulate their complex biological clocks. But all the life previous to day four doesn't need to have that information. 
And so bacteria and fungi, for example, are quite happy if they never see where the sun, moon, and stars are in the sky. But that doesn't work uh, for birds and for mammals and uh, for certain insects as well. And so this is when God transforms our atmosphere from being translucent, permanently overcast, to where it's now transparent at a sufficient amount of time that the creatures can actually regulate their biological clocks by the position of the sun, moon, and stars. And just in the past few months, geophysicists have discovered what was responsible for transforming our atmosphere from being permanently overcast to at least on occasion transparent. And it has to do with the great oxygenation events where we have very little oxygen for the first two and a quarter billion years of Earth's history. Then you've got what's called the first great oxygenation event, but then it drops down to a low number. And then about 600 million years ago, it jumps from 1% up to 8%, then 10%, and up to the current uh, 21%. And when it jumps from 1% to 8%, this is when the atmosphere transforms. That happened about 575 million years ago. It hit 10% 543 million years ago. But something else we find very fascinating in the fossil record, it fulfills what we see in Creation Day 5. Creation Day 5, it says, let the seas swarm with these sea creatures. The Avalon explosion 575 million years ago is when our planet suddenly transforms from microscopic life to creatures with body sizes as much as two meters across. Now these are animals that don't have a skeleton, they don't have a digestive tract, they don't have a mouth or an anus, they don't have lungs or a heart, but they're literally two meters across. They can't exist unless there's at least 8% oxygen in the atmosphere. But what we notice is the moment we see this jump from 1% to 8%, these animals suddenly appear. They come out of nowhere. You go from bacteria and microscopic fungi to these big creatures. They just come suddenly upon the scene the moment oxygen hits 8%. Then there's an extinction event where they're all driven out of existence and a million years later, we have the Cambrian explosion. Now oxygen's 10%. Now there's enough oxygen, you can have animals with shells and a skeleton with a digestive tract. And then this is the Cambrian explosion of animals, creatures like these trilobites, for example. But once again, they come out of nowhere. They just suddenly appear upon the scene. Even atheist biologists like Richard Dawkins has written in their book, that these creatures come into existence out of nowhere with no evolutionary history. Now, a few years ago, a very detailed review of the Cameron explosion was written by Kevin Peterson in Bioessays. This is what he said, elucidating the materialistic basis, that is the non-theistic basis for the Cameron explosion, has become more elusive, not less, the more we learn about the event itself. The more we learn about the Avalon and Cameron explosion, the more obvious it becomes. This is, these are supernatural events. They can't happen without the handiwork of God. Creation day five, we see the second origin of life, which you see in Genesis one as three separate origins of life. The origin of physical life, creation day one. The origin of soulish life, creation day five. Here again, for the second time only, you see the word create. God created the universe. Now this is the second usage of the word bara, where it says God created the birds and the sea mammals. And it actually uses two verbs. It says God made them and he created them. Their bodies were not brand new. Other creatures had physical bodies. What was brand new, these were the first animals on the face of the earth endowed with mind, will, and emotions and also endowed with a motivation to serve and please a higher species. We weren't here yet, but these animals were designed in advance to serve and please as human beings, and they were endowed with a capacity to form relationships with us. The book of Job says, look to the birds, they'll teach you. Look to the beasts of the field, they'll instruct you. Here's one instruction. As they were created to serve and please a higher species, we human beings were created to serve and please a higher being. As they were created to serve and please us, 
We were created to serve and please God. Creation Day 6. The Bible never talks about God creating the first land mammals. Instead, it jumps ahead and talks about God creating three categories of very advanced land mammals, the ones that are going to be crucial for launching human civilization. Now, there's a lot more on this in the book of Job. Job 38 and 39 go into this in detail. What you have here in Genesis chapter 1 is a single sentence. Keep in mind, Job predates the content of Genesis. And so Moses didn't have to go into great detail on this because Job had already laid this out uh, for them. But these are the three categories. The short-legged land mammals. You say, what do we need those for civilization? Well, here's the problem with human beings. Our bodies are wonderfully designed for hot climates. They're terribly designed for cold climates. But thanks to these little rodents, notice that these are warm-blooded mammals with small body sizes. The only way they can maintain their body heat is to grow thick, luxuriant fur. And so early humans quickly exploited these creatures because one thing they learned, they like hanging around us. They don't mind being around thousands of their friends. And if we make pets out of them and take care of them, they'll provide us with all the clothing we need so that we can move humanity into all the continental masses of the world. And two lo kinds of long-legged land mammals, those that are easy to tame, are reference to the herbivores. And you'll see these mentioned in the book of Job, how God gave us these long-legged herbivores to launch agricultural industry. And then the long-legged creatures that are difficult to tame a reference to the carnivores that he created so that we could have companions and household pets. I mean, that's what we do, right? You don't really try to make a pet cow and bring him into your living room. You quickly discover you can't housebreak that cow, and there'll be consequences. However, you can bring a carnivore in. They're more difficult to tame, but they make wonderful companions. Again, the principle, some to serve, others to please. And likewise, we have that responsibility in relating to God. If you want to read more about these advanced animals, I've written a book, Hidden Treasures in the Book of Job, where I take you in detail through Job 37, 38, and 39. But there's a lesson of humility there. We think we humans launch civilization all by ourselves. What we see in Genesis and Job, we would have never launched civilization if God hadn't given this, these animals mentioned on Creation Day 6. We'd be nowhere. We know that because when people moved into Australia, they wiped out the animals that are mentioned in the book of Job that lived there. And notice the Aborigines were stuck in the Stone Age at a low population level until Europeans and Americans came and brought the animals that they had killed off thousands of years ago. And then it ends with the third use of the word create, referring to human beings. We're different from all other life forms. We're not just physical, we're not just soulish, we are spiritual. We're the only species that has the spiritual capacity to be able to relate to God himself. We're the only ones that engage in philosophy. And so we were created in the image of God. Well, I saw this pattern way back when I was 17 years of age before I'd become a Christian. But what I realized is, once you understand that this word yom, translated day, is an epoch of time, and the frame of reference for the six creation days is the surface of the earth, you get a perfect fit with the established scientific record for the history of earth and all of its life. The Bible gets a perfect score on the description and the placement of the initial conditions, and a perfect score on the order and the description of the events of creation that are mentioned. Seeing these results was a major factor in my signing my name in the back of a Gideon Bible at age 19, giving my life to Jesus Christ. It was also a huge factor when I first met my wife, Kathy. I met her at a Bible study, and the first thing she said to me was, you're a Caltech astronomer and you're a Christian, what do you do with Genesis 1? <laughs> now, She's not the only one. I get that all the time. And what I found out is that her brother, who was the youth leader in her church growing up, left the Christian faith 
because he thought Genesis 1 taught scientific nonsense. This is why it's important that every Christian be prepared to be able to defend the inerrancy and the inspiration of Genesis 1, because you're not going to get away with it. You can't avoid it. The non-Christians will put you on the spot. And by the way, you don't have to be an astronomer and a pastor like myself. What we've done at Reasons to Believe is to prepare this small group video teaching series. Basically, it's eight 20-minute DVDs that take you through the creation days one at a time. So you get to absorb it. And by the way, it's discussion base. I do this in front of an audience of about 15 young people between 17 and 34, some of them Christians, brand new Christians, others non-Christians. You get to see the impact of what happens to the audience of 15 as they go through these eight segments. And it's a great way to get discussion going. It's a great way to get yourself equipped to be able to defend uh, Genesis uh, chapter 1. And in closing, I would say, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. And if you read this in the Greek, when it talks about reason, it's talking about the reasons that people need that you're talking to. And then do this with gentleness, respect, and a clear conscience, because people listen more clearly uh, to your demeanor than they do uh, your words. But just a quick story in closing. I was in an airport waiting for a flight, and uh, my wife called me, and we're working on a fifth edition of a little booklet called Genesis 1, A Scientific Perspective. A gentleman about 20 feet away heard a little bit of the phone conversation, and after I put down the phone, he came over to me and said, were you talking about Genesis 1? And I said, yes. And he says, you seem to think it's actually true. And I said, yes. <laughs> and he said, well, uh, you know, I'm a computer scientist. I'm a professor at Stanford. Uh, what makes you think that this is scientifically correct? And I said, well, I'm an astronomer. And I, you know, I was on the faculty at Caltech. And he says, I got a lot of questions for you. We got on the plane. You know, he had a first class seat at the front. We were in the very back of the plane. But uh, once uh, the, the stewardess said it was okay, he got up out of his first class seat, walked all the way to the back of the plane, and he stood there for the entire flight talking to us about Genesis 1. He wouldn't leave us alone. We walked a baggage claim, the conversation kept going. He picked up his bags. He still wanted to talk. We exchanged business cards, and the conversation's been continuing. There's something impactful when a non-Christian adult meets a Christian who actually believes Genesis 1 is scientifically true, and it's a demonstration of the inerrancy of the Bible. You, if you prepare these uh, yourself, you're going to see God supernaturally bringing people across your path. Okay, I've got two minutes left, so I'm going to take these two minutes for any question that you care to ask. So it doesn't have to be in this topic. And I'll try to repeat the question. Okay, yes. You've been at this a long time now. How have you seen generate the generations? How do they change in their questions about this issue? Well, they've been, okay, what's happening, especially with young men, if you actually go to these atheist websites, they're really trying to draw in young single men. You know, and I'm finding everywhere I travel, these young single men have become the disciples of the Richard Dawkins and the Michael Shermers of the world but they haven't really looked at the Bible for themselves, and they haven't really talked to anybody who's taken the time to go through the text. They believe that what Michael Shermer says about Genesis has got to be correct. We have a great opportunity to say, you know what? You've been sold a bill of goods. Let's actually go through the text. And that's why we developed this DVD series. Basically, I don't answer all the questions. I get the audience started. And my goal is they would talk about it amongst themselves and make the discoveries themselves. What I've noticed, especially with the millennials, they don't want to be preached at. They want to make the discoveries themselves. So that's kind of the approach we take. Okay, I've got time for one more question. Over here. Right. Well, okay, I deal with this actually in my book, A Matter of Days, 
And yes, uh, in the Young Earth Creations community, they try to claim that we can actually have light from distant galaxies reach the Earth uh, quickly, uh, recognizing that the velocity of light might have been a million times faster, uh, billions, or, you know, um, billions of light years out uh, than it is today. They're basically saying that the velocity of light was about a factor of a million times faster for Adam and Eve than it was for us today. And Barry Setterfield, um, he's an Australian, and by the way, he does not even have a bachelor's degree. So, and you know, one of the things I try to do when I debate people is make sure that they're at an academic level where they actually understand the arguments. But I did respond to Barry. Uh, he sent me an email, I sent him one back, uh, but the email he sent back to me clearly told me he doesn't even understand the basics of physics. Uh, so that was disappointing. Uh, but here's the simple thing. Everywhere you go in the world, everybody knows one equation. They don't know F equals MA, but they know E equals MC squared. Okay, C is the velocity of light, M is mass, E is energy. If the velocity of light was a factor of a million times faster for atom, what does that do for the energy coming out of the sun? It makes the heat of the sun one trillion times hotter. So... Yeah, I understand what Barry is doing, but what Barry is doing is disingenuous in the sense that he's actually taking constants from somewhere else, changing those in order to try to fix up E equals MC squared, not realizing what he's done with the other constants is catastrophic for life. And by the way, we astronomers can measure the velocity of light in distant stars and galaxies. I tried to explain that to Barry. The fact is that uh, you're going to see these hyperfine split spectral lines. The degree of splitting tells you what the velocity of light was when that light left the star or the galaxy. Okay, as we look at galaxies 13 billion light years away, the velocity of light is identical to what we measure here on Earth. Also, Barry misunderstood the data that goes back 300 years. Pardon me? Okay, Barry was referring, okay, excuse me. Yes, okay, you can read a matter of days. By the way, the vast majority of young earth creationists have abandoned that argument because they realize it's not a good argument. And what I explain in a matter of days is multiple lines of reasoning why the velocity of light must be constant. And it's part of the anthropic principle. Any change in the velocity of light destroys the possibility of life existing. So the very fact that you ask the question is proof that the velocity of light has not changed throughout cosmic history. And let me end with this. The Bible itself tells us the constants of physics don't change. Seven places in the Bible we're told, I'll talk about this tomorrow, that what God says, for example, in Jeremiah 33, you Jews change, I don't change. I never change. As proof that I don't change, look at the laws that govern the heavens and the earth. As they don't change, I don't change. And there are six other places in the Bible which make the statement, the laws of physics were established by God at the beginning of the universe, and they remain fixed and unchanged until a full number of human beings has been redeemed. Why? Those laws of physics are critical to bring about the redemption of billions of human beings. The whole universe was created to bring about the possibility of the existence of billions of human beings who could be redeemed. That's a theme I bring out in uh, why the universe is the way it is, and you'll see citations there establishing why there can't be a change in the velocity of light. I'm about two minutes over time. Uh, thank you. Well, yesterday, I tried to get you prepared on how to use the early chapters of Genesis as a witnessing tool. What I've learned as a pastor is it's difficult to get people to share their faith uh, with non-Christian adults if they're not prepared to deal with the challenges they're gonna face in the book of Genesis. And people often ask me, okay, in fact, I got questions about this card yesterday. Of these four, where would you start uh, with the skeptic? And I says, well, the most compelling scientific evidence comes from the universe. Why? Because astronomy is the only scientific discipline where we get direct access to the past because all of our information comes to us from past events. It takes light time to travel from these galaxies to our telescope. 
and we actually now have telescopes so powerful we can see all the way back to the cosmic creation event. Now, some people think that's got to be an exaggeration. This is how close we can get images back in time. We can actually see the state of the universe when it's a hundred billionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second old. That's so close we can get to the cosmic creation event and explains why we get the most compelling evidences for the God of the Bible from the discipline of astronomy. However, there's a serious weakness. We astronomers are totally ignorant of the present. That's why when I talk to my wife, I say, you can't hold me accountable for the present. I'm an astronomer. Uh, I'm only accountable for past events. So, well, let's jump into this. Cosmic reasons to believe in Jesus Christ. And sometimes what I get from my fellow scientists and engineers, I say, okay, we can understand how science reveals God. How does it reveal the person of Jesus Christ? So we're going to take that on this morning. And here's a quick outline of where I'm going to be taking you. We're going to look at cosmic reasons for why the causal agent of the universe must be transcendent beyond space and time. The number two, why this transcendent causal agent must be a personal loving God. And finally, why it must be a redeeming God, a God intent on redeeming billions of human beings. And that's what really separates Jesus Christ from the gods of the other religions. Now, as I mentioned yesterday, I became addicted to astronomy when I was seven years of age. And the first book I read on cosmology at age seven was a book by Fred Hoyle called Nature of the Universe. Now, Fred was very opposed to Christianity, and he made no bones about it in this book. But one of the things he said in this book that caught my attention at age seven, he says, there's a good deal of cosmology in the Bible. It is a remarkable conception. And it was at age 17 that because of astronomy, I became persuaded there had to be a God to explain the universe. And I began to go through the holy books, religions of the world, and I discovered what Fred said back there in the nature of the universe indeed is correct. That if you compare what the Bible says about the origin and history of the universe to all the other holy books, it says about 10 times as much as all the other holy books combined. And as I began to go through uh, the Bible at age 17, I found that there were four features of the universe that the Bible repeatedly address. And these are the four. That the universe is traceable back to a singularity beginning. Now that's a physics term, which means a beginning of matter, energy, space, and time. That the universe continuously expands from that space-time beginning, it expands under laws of physics that do not change, and that one of those laws is a pervasive law of decay. Now, what I'm going to do in the next few minutes is show you where in the Bible these statements are made and what the latest discoveries in astrophysics do to establish that so what the Bible said thousands of years ago indeed is correct. As I mentioned yesterday, no matter where I travel in the world, everybody knows Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But this isn't the only text that talks about the singularity beginning of the universe. For example, you got in the New Testament, Hebrews 11.3, the universe that we can detect did not come from that which we can detect. Well, what can we detect? We can detect matter, energy, space, and time. And these are several other texts. And as I mentioned yesterday, God actually claims to initiate his works of redemption before he even creates the universe. There actually is a beginning of space and time. The grace of God that we now experience was put into effect before the beginning of time. What's unique about the Bible is it actually speaks about the beginning of the universe as the beginning of space and time itself. Quite different from what you see in the Eastern phase, where it says that space and time are eternal and God creates within space and time. In biblical faith, God is actually the master of space and time. He's the creator of space and time. He's not subject to it. Now, as I mentioned yesterday, I was reading the Bible seriously for the first time when physicists in Britain were developing the first of the space-time theorems. There's now 30 of these theorems that have been published and I brought with me the latest of these space-time theorems 
titled Inflationary Space Times Are Not Past Incomplete. I mean, I don't know where they come up with these titles, uh, but this is a paper you simply can't put down once you get into it. If you're fans of tensor calculus, you're just going to love what this paper's got to say. Uh, but it concludes with a statement that I think every human being can understand. And this is the conclusion. Any universe that expands on average has a space-time beginning implying a causal agent outside space and time who creates space, time, matter, and energy. Now, two of the three authors of this paper, Arvind Borde and Alexander Vilenkin, they spent a decade of their career searching for some way where they wouldn't be stuck with this causal agent. And during that period, they did publish some papers where they say, here's how we can avoid the causal agent. But every one of those models would not permit the existence of life. And so what would they recognize is, in order for life to be possible, the universe must be expanding. And every expanding universe model is subject to the grip of the space-time theorems, which means there really is this causal agent beyond space and time. And it was Alexander Vilenkin himself who wrote this. I gave you this quote yesterday. With the proof now in place, cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. There is no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. And what is that problem? Proof of a space-time beginning implies a causal agent beyond space and time who creates our universe of space-time, matter, and energy. And I was sharing with a few of you earlier this morning how I got to speak at NASA Houston a few years ago. And the director there said, I know you're here to speak on the scientific evidence for God, but I forbid you to use the word God in your talk. And I said, this is going to be a challenge, given what I'm supposed to be speaking on. But I said, how about this? Instead of using the word God, can I use the words, uh, this, this causal agent beyond space and time, who created and designed the universe for the benefit of human beings? And he said, fine, you can use that. So, <laughs> which I thought was actually better, because now I actually got to define God. But here's the bottom line. A transcendent God must exist. The space-time theorems prove that there must be an agent beyond space and time who created the universe. Now, if you read the latest books being put out by atheist physicists and astronomers, probably the best known is A Universe from Nothing by Lawrence Krauss. If you read these books, you discover that they're conceding deism. They acknowledge that there's no way they can avoid a deistic interpretation of the universe because of the force of these space-time theorems. The battle in terms of what's going on between atheists and theists with respect to physics and astronomy has shifted to whether or not this causal agent is a personal being. They recognize that there must be an agent beyond space and time that created everything, but people like Stephen Hawking and Lawrence Krauss are insisting that this agent cannot possibly be a personal being. So this is really the challenge we're facing as believers. Yes, a transcendent agent must exist, but is God personal, and did he design the cosmos and the earth for the redemption of billions of human beings? That's the question I want to address this morning. But before I go there, let me finish taking you through the fundamental features of cosmology that the Bible addresses, because all we've addressed so far is that first one, that namely the Bible claims there's a singularity beginning to the universe. As much as the Bible says about the beginning of the universe, it actually says much more about the expansion of the universe. Now, one reason why a lot of believers have not recognized this, it's not in Genesis. It's not in the Torah. But you do see it in the book of Job that I believe is actually the oldest book of the Bible. So right away in Job chapter 9, we have the statement that God alone expands the universe. And there's actually 11 passages that speak about the expansion of the universe. I think another reason why it's often missed on people that speak English, our, trans, our Bibles typically translate the word nata as the stretching out, but it actually means expansion. And these are the texts that speak about this. By the way, as I mentioned yesterday, I've debated Michael Shermer, the executive director of the Skeptic Society, many times. And this subject often comes up. 
And Michael realized if he concedes that the Bible speaks about the expansion of the universe, it proves that the Bible has predictive power because the Bible was the only book that spoke about this expansion. So what he did in the debates, he insisted that all these passages were simply figures of speech. The Bible's not really saying that we live in an expanding universe. He says, you, Hugh, are reading this into the text because you're a 21st century astronomer. Well, if you actually look at these 11 texts in the original Hebrew language, you'll notice that the verb nata shows up in all three Hebrew verb forms, which means it literally is speaking about the expansion of the universe. And by the way, it's not just astronomers like me that are reading this into the text with the knowledge that we do indeed live in an expanding universe. This was recognized by Jewish theologians living 800, 900 years ago. But yeah, the drama here is no book of science, philosophy, or theology outside of the Bible even hinted that we live in an expanding universe apart from the Bible. For thousands of years, the Bible stood alone as the only text making this claim. Now, I've written a whole book, The Creator and the Cosmos, establishing why indeed we know we live in an expanding universe. I don't have time to give you the most compelling reasons why that must be true, but I will give you a visual one. And thanks to the Hubble Space Telescope. So here are two Hubble Space Telescope images and over here, we have a, an image of galaxies located 12 billion light years away, contrasted with a different image where we're looking at galaxies 2 billion light years away. And I purposely set up these two images to the same spatial scale. So what you see here is that the galaxies uh, 2 billion light years away, which means we're seeing the galaxies as they were 2 billion years ago. See how much farther apart they are? than galaxies that we're looking at that are 12 billion years back in time. And here we notice the galaxies are jammed so tightly together, they're tearing spiral arms off one another. But as you move forward 10 billion years, this phenomena has virtually disappeared. And if we had time, I could show you dozens of other Hubble Space Telescope images that basically show you with respect to time, indeed, the universe is stretching out, it's expanding, where the galaxies are getting farther and farther apart. And seven times in the Bible, it tells us that the laws of physics do not change. And by the way, there's a good reason they don't change. God set them in place to be tools for redemption. And so what we see in Jeremiah 33, for example, is God speaking to the Jews and saying, you change your mind all the time but I don't change. I'm the immutable God. As proof that I'm the unchanging God, look at the laws that govern the heavens and the earth. As they don't change, I don't change. And what you see in Romans chapter 8, the entire creation is subject to the law of decay. And as an astronomer, I can tell you, it's impossible to separate the dimensions of space from the dimension of time. So when the Bible says the entire creation, that means not only all of its geography, it also means all of its history. And so this law of decay has remained fixed and constant for the entire history of the universe. But this is a fourth feature. Repeatedly, the Bible speaks about how everything in the universe is subject to a pervasive law of decay. And hey, look around you. We're all evidence of that ongoing decay, right? <laughs> I mean, my hair used to be black, it's not anymore, <laughs> so. Now, I remember doing a debate at the University of California, Santa Barbara, where a quantum atheist physicist there said, I want to see the Bible making a prediction with hard numbers that we can put to the test through actual measurements. And I responded to him later by saying, hey, notice what the Bible says, space-time beginning, expansion from that space-time beginning, under laws of physics that don't change, where one of those laws is a pervasive law of decay. That implies that the universe must get colder and colder as it gets older and older. I mean, it's the principle of thermodynamics. It's how you got here this morning if you drove here. Your car engine has pistons in it, and when the piston chamber expands, the temperature goes down and your gasoline stops burning. And when the piston chamber compresses, the temperature goes up and it can reignite the gasoline, assuming you've got a diesel engine. That principle applies to everything in the universe. 
So with an expanding universe, it gets colder and colder in a highly predictable way. Now, if we know the age of the universe and we can measure that through a dozen different ways, we get a biblically predicted cooling curve for the universe. So this line you see here, this curve, that's the biblically predicted cooling curve uh, for the universe. And overlapping that are 13 actual measurements we astronomers have made of the past temperature of the universe. The latest measurement is this one right here, where the air bar is so tiny, it's thinner than the thickness of the line, but it perfectly fits right on that line. So this is a dramatic example of the Bible making a numerical prediction thousands of years ago that we can put to a hard test through actual measurements, and it passes the test with flying colors. One of the most dramatic demonstrations that the Bible indeed has predictive power. And if the Bible has predictive power, it must be inspired by the one that did the deed. Okay, let me go back to this question. Is God personal, and did he design the universe and the earth for the redemption of billions of human beings? Today, we not only know that the universe is expanding at just the right rate to make human beings possible, we know what's responsible for the expansion of the universe. It's something called dark energy. We only discovered it back in 1999 and it's the energy that's embedded in the space surface of the universe. And by the way, all the stars and galaxies are constrained to the three-dimensional surface of the four-dimensional expanding universe. And here's, here's some things we know about this uh, dark energy. It makes up about three-quarters of all the stuff of the universe. I find it interesting that we humans were ignorant of the dominant component of the universe until 1999. It's actually a question you see in the book of Job, chapter 38, verses 19 and 20. Do you know where darkness resides? Can you take me to its place? Now, when I was a student studying astronomy, I was told that darkness was the absence of light. Job says it's an actual substance. Today we know Job got it right. It indeed is a substance. Moreover, it makes up most of the stuff of the universe. And this dark energy works in the following way. The more the surface of the universe gets bigger as the universe expands, the more powerful that dark energy is to accelerate the expansion of the universe. Now here's the situation. If you expand the universe too slowly from the cosmic creation event, gravity will collect all the gas of the universe and compress it into nothing but black holes and neutron stars. And the minimum density of those bodies is about two billion tons per level teaspoonful. So dense, molecules are impossible, atoms are impossible, even protons and electrons are impossible, and of course, life would be impossible. On the other hand, if you expand the universe too quickly from the cosmic creation event, gravity is not gonna be able to collect that gas to make any stars at all. If there are no stars, again, there's no possibility for life. And so astronomers have calculated to what degree must we fine-tune dark energy so that we can have stars and planets where life can possibly exist on the planets. The answer is you have to fine-tune it to one part in 10 to the 122nd place of the, death of the power index. It ranks as the greatest fine-tuning example we can measure in all of science. Now, 122 zeros after the one, it's kind of hard to visualize. I'm gonna to try to give you a lay person's appreciation for what that fine tuning design makes. How many of you have heard of the discovery of gravity waves back in February? Okay, it's probably gonna win the Nobel Prize. And, so, and I got articles on our reasons.org website. By the way, it's a far more significant discovery than what they announced on TV. Uh, I won't go into it, but it's, it's an amazing discovery. And that discovery was possible because we, we basically put into effect the world's most sophisticated instrument. The gravity wave telescope that we physicists have been able to design and build is so amazingly designed, it can measure movement of the mirrors to within one-tenth the diameter of a proton over the course of four kilometers. That's how amazingly designed this telescope is. Now, that ranks as the epitome of human engineering creativity and design. But if we were to compare 
this best example of human creativity and design to the design we see just in dark energy to make life possible, it ranks 10 to the 97 times inferior. In other words, the design we see in dark energy is 10 to the 97 times better than the best human example we've been able to produce. Now, it was physicists at Caltech and MIT that invented this machine and designed this machine, and it was your tax dollars that made it all possible. But what this comparison tells us is that the one that designed dark energy to make possible the existence of life, at a minimum, is 10 trillion 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 times more intelligent and better educated than those Caltech and MIT physicists. Now, I've worked with these people. They're not stupid. They're prob <laughs> they, their rank is the most brilliant individuals on the planet, but they do not compare to the brilliance and the education of the one that designed dark energy for a benefit. Or to put it another way, this transcendent causal agent, at a minimum, is 10 to the 97 times better funded than the U.S. government. <laughs> now, that was a more powerful argument a few years ago than it is today, but uh, it basically makes the point that this causal agent must be a personal being, because only a personal being can manifest the attributes of intellect, knowledge, creativity, power, and care for his creation. And by the way, it's not just people like myself, Christian astronomers, that are seeing this feature of dark energy. It's been appreciated just as well by atheist theoretical physicists. And I brought a paper here with me, published by three atheist theoretical physicists, and it's titled, Disturbing Implications of a Cosmological Constant. That's another term for dark energy. And when this paper was published, the atheist physicist editor of the British journal Nature interviewed them. And this is published in Nature, and this is what they said in the interview. Arranging the universe as we think it is arranged, say the team, would have required a miracle. And that's an amazing statement for three atheist theoretical physicists to make. But they went on to say, an unknown agent, namely beyond space and time, intervene in the evolution or the history of the universe for reasons of its own. That explains the title of their paper, Disturbing Implications. <laughs> Very disturbing for these atheist theoretical physicists to acknowledge that there must be this agent beyond space and time performing miracles for reasons of his own, which explains why they closed off their paper with this sentence. Here's the final sentence in their paper. Perhaps the only reasonable conclusion is that we do not live in a world with a true cosmological constant. In other words, they said dark energy must be wrong, because if dark energy is real, then we got this agent performing miracles for reasons of his own. And certainly that can't be, so dark energy must be wrong. The irony of this paper is it was published just months before we astronomers came up with nine independent observational demonstrations that not only is dark energy real, it's the dominant component of the universe. And you'll actually see a set of articles on our reasons.org website where I list and describe for you and explain for you these nine different demonstrations that dark energy definitely is real. And that's the URL that you can go to uh, reasons.org slash articles, and there's the rest of the URL uh, for them. By the way, if you go to that URL, you'll actually find that I've added another 16, because today we have 25 demonstrations that dark energy is real and the dominant component of the universe. What does that mean? It means this transcendent causal agent really must be a personal being. He has designed the universe for the benefit of our human beings. He's performing miracles for the benefit of the human species. Now, dark energy ranks as the most spectacular evidence for fine-tuning design, but it's not the only one. Virtually every feature of the laws of physics and the features of the universe reveal this overwhelming evidence for fine-tuning design. So here are a few examples. Now, in order to have stars, stable burning stars, it's crucial 
that the electromagnetic force be stronger than the gravitational force, and the ratio of the strength of those two forces must be fine-tuned to one part in 10,000 trillion trillion trillion. If that doesn't happen, stars will never exist, or stars will form and immediately explode. Both ways, no life is possible. You also have to fine-tune the number of protons relative to the number of electrons to better than a trillion trillion trillion, much better than that, for life to be possible. Now, it tells us in, uh, by the way, the C stands for carbon-based life. I say that because a couple of times I've debated uh, atheist physicists, and they say, well, what about life that's not like we know it? And I says, oh, you mean angels. And I said, definitely we have a different set of fine-tuning for angels than we do for us human beings. But for, as far as the universe is concerned, carbon is the only game in town. You can only build life on the carbon molecule. There is no other element in the periodic table which will permit the existence of life. So that's the only assumption that comes to bear there. But if this design is a supernatural handiwork of the God of the Bible, we would expect this list to grow as we learn more about the universe. And indeed, that is the case. Job in Psalms says the more we study the book of nature, the more evidence we'll uncover for the handiwork and the attributes of God. You'll see that repeatedly in those two books. So starting in 1991, our scientific team at Reasons to Believe went through the scientific literature and discovered there were 17 different features of the universe and the laws of physics that showed this extraordinarily high level of fine-tuning design. But notice how the list has grown with respect to time. It's now over 200 different features must be fine-tuned, demonstrating the principle that the more we learn about the book of nature, the more evidence we'll see for God's handiwork and for his personal attributes. And by the way, you can go to reasons.org slash fine-tuning, and you'll see the documentation and the citations to the literature uh, that will establish that this indeed uh, is the case. And we've taken it to the level of the universe in terms of our galaxy. Let me put it this way. You can go to a bookstore, any secular bookstore. You can go to the University of Texas bookstore, and you'll find about 50 books written in what's called the Anthropic Principle. And most of those books are published by physicists and astronomers who are not believers. But they all agree that when we look at the universe as a whole, in the words of Paul Davies, we see overwhelming evidence for design. But that's typically where they stop. What we have done at Reasons to Believe is to say that if there's this overwhelming evidence for design on the scale of the whole universe, and this is the handiwork of God, we're also going to find it in the scale of our galaxy cluster, our galaxy, our planetary system, our star, and the features of our planet. And so, beginning in 1995, we began to look at the features, fine-tuned features, of our galaxy and our planetary system. And back in 1995, we found 41 different features that had been scientifically identified that had to be fine-tuned to make life possible on any body that could exist in the universe. And this probability here is the probability of us finding that kind of body without invoking divine miraculous intervention. That was one chance in 10 to the 31st power back in 1991. Notice it's now one part in 10 to the 1,050th power that we're going to find such a body today, 824 different features. By the way, I've been accumulating a database that I haven't had time to update, but I can tell you this, the number of features that must be fine-tuned is well over 1,000. But even if you look at that last column, the probability that you're going to find a body anywhere within this vast universe of 50 billion trillion stars with a possibility of being able to sustain any kind of advanced life, that probability is more remote than someone in California winning the California lottery 150 consecutive times where they buy just one ticket each time. Or as a mathematician friend of mine put it, it's the same probability of winning the California lottery 150 consecutive times where you don't buy any tickets at all. <laughs> so, but if you actually look at this last column, 
what you notice is that the probability that it's the God of the Bible that's responsible for us being to live here on planet Earth, that probability is getting roughly a factor of a million times stronger per month. And frequently when I'm on a university campus, I'll say to the skeptics, if you're not persuaded today, wait a month and let's see what happens to the accumulating evidence. If that accumulating evidence goes up by factors of thousands or millions, then you need to seriously consider the claims on your life that are made in the Holy Bible. Where else in apologetics can you go where you get a million times more evidence on a monthly basis? This is again the power of the astronomical evidence. And here's a quote from Freeman Dyson, not a believer, a uh, famous physicist, and he says, the more I examine the universe, the more evidence I find that the universe in some sense must have known we were coming. This is a consensus. Regardless of the theological perspective of astronomers and physicists, they all agree here uh, with Freeman Dyson that when you look at the universe, you can't avoid the conclusion. It was designed for the specific benefit of us human beings. Now, I want to close with this. It must also have known that the Creator intended to redeem billions of human beings. Let me take you back to Romans 8. The whole creation groans, and it goes on to say, the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. Now, when I read the Bible and see statements like this, it drives me to the why question. What is it about the law of decay that helps bring about the freedom and glory of the children of God. And so as a physicist, I said, I gotta understand what's going on here and recognize that we actually live in a universe that has the optimal physics for the defeat and the removal of evil and for willing human beings to receive redemption. That applies literally to every law of physics. It applies to every dimension of space and time. It's all been designed to bring about the removal of evil and suffering and the redemption of billions of human beings. Now, I've written an entire book on this, why the universe is the way it is, but let me just pick out one example. Because the Bible really focuses, amongst all the laws of physics, mostly on this law of decay. Okay, what we notice about the law of decay, the decay rate is not so high as to discourage productive work. Now, my wife always tries to get me to do yard work. But one of the things that discourages me from doing yard work, I can spend four hours in her backyard making the backyard look really nice, and then about 10 days later, I gotta do it all over again. It's like, the rate of decay is so high here, what motivation do I have to maintain the backyard? So, I'd rather write a book. A book is gonna last a lot longer than the lawn in my backyard. However, the rate of decay is not so high that it would discourage us from all work, okay? It's low enough that we'd be say, hey, I can produce stuff, and yes, I've got to maintain it, but it's going to last a while. But notice this, the decay rate is not so low as to let sin go unrestrained. And it'd be great if I could do yard work and it'd be maintained for a good year. But if the decay rate were that low, then there wouldn't be adequate restraint against the human expression of sin and evil. Let me take you back to Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve rebel against God, and God pronounces some consequences upon them. Basically says to Adam and Eve, because you have now chosen to walk away from me, to rebel against me, from now on you'll experience more pain and more work, and it implies more wasted time. Now, God intended that work uh, would be pleasurable. He also intended that the sense of touch would be pleasurable. But because of our sin and our evil, we now experience more pain, more work, and more wasted time. And by the way, none of us likes that. And because we despise having to work harder, experience more pain, and more wasted time, this acts as a powerful motivation for all of us to avoid evil and to maintain a path of virtue. But it also teaches us that we can't do it without help. 
I mean, we try to say, okay, you know what? I'm going to get a, you know, a whole lot more work if I go along this path. We discover we're not able to prevent ourselves from committing sin and evil. But we look at the universe and we realize the God that created the universe is all powerful and all loving. I'm not able to deliver myself from the consequences of my sin and evil, but based on his power and his love, he must have provided a way out. And it was Job himself who acknowledged that God himself has provided the way out and he was going to count on that way out. Now, I describe this in this book, Why the Universe is the Way It Is. Basically take you through the laws of physics, explain why the universe must be as big as it is, why it must be as old as it is. All of it plays a role in making possible the redemption of billions of human beings. Uh, let me close with a couple of short stories. Uh, I was on an airplane once, well, I was actually waiting for an airplane, and uh, I got called up to the front. That's not always a good sign. And uh, they said, uh, you know, Mr. Ross, uh, we have to give up your seat. Can we put you in first class? And I said, I think I can handle that. So <laughs> it's only the second time in my life I ever flew first class. And I wound up being seated beside this gentleman, and he said, I never fly first class either. But he says, Microsoft is insisting on flying me first class. I'm consulting for them. And I said, well, what do you do? And he says, well, I'm a quantum physicist. I'm from Germany and I'm an atheist and a skeptic. Now, <laughs> rarely do people introduce themselves that way to a total stranger. <laughs> so he said, well, what do you do? And I says, well, I'm not a quantum physicist. I'm an astrophysicist. And I'm not a skeptic and an atheist. I'm a Christian. And he said, this is going to be a really interesting flight. <laughs> so, and he peppered me for two hours with eight questions. First question he asks is, well, if God is responsible for this universe, why does he waste himself by making 200 billion galaxies? Certainly one galaxy would be enough. And maybe we don't even need a galaxy. Why not just our planetary system? Why not just the sun and the earth? So I explained to him why you needed exactly 50 billion trillion stars, no more, no less, for life to be possible. You can't even get carbon and oxygen unless the universe has a highly fine-tuned total mass. And so he said, well, I've got another question. And then he went on with another question. And then he finally asked me, he said, why are you so pre well prepared to answer these eight questions that I gave you? And I said, well, the eight questions you asked are all chapter titles in my book, Why the Universe is the Way It Is. And I said, you're not the first person to ask me these questions. I said, I get these kinds of questions all the time. And he says, I got to see this. And I said, well, I actually have a copy of the book in my briefcase. <laughs> so I pulled out this book and he looked at the table of contents and says, you're right. These are the eight questions I was asking. <laughs> and as we walked the baggage claim together, he calculated for me the probability that a German quantum physicist who's an atheist <laughs> would be seated in first class beside uh, you know, uh, an astrophysicist who is a Christian, he says, it's way less than one chance in a billion. And he says, I know what happened today is not an accident. He took a copy of the crater, in a, of, uh, pardon me, why the universe is the way it is. And as we're walking to baggage claim, he says, you know, I'm German. And he spoke excellent English. But he said, do you have anything in German? And I said, yeah, I do. I gave him a copy of our DVD, uh, Journey Toward Creation. It's in 11 languages. And by the way, at our table, the book is there and the DVD is there. So you can be praying for the German quantum physicists. And uh, I'll close with just one more quick story. And uh, it features this thing. It's a DVD you'll see out there. It's called The Great Debate. That's not the title we put on it, because this debate happened at Caltech at the International Skeptic Society Conference. And it was a two-day conference where they brought in leading atheist scientists from all over the world to speak on the non-existence of God. And then they had me at the very end debate uh, Victor Stenger, a particle physicist. And uh, the great debate is actually the message you've heard today. When I had my chance to speak, what you heard today is what I gave them. And what you're going to be able to see in this debate is how an audience of 700 highly educated atheists from around the world responded to what they heard you what they act, actually what you heard this morning. 
Now, I'll tell you the response, because it's not on the DVD. What they told me afterwards was, this is the first time they'd ever heard a scientific defense of the Christian faith. They said, we've been exposed to many debates between Christians and atheists, but this is the first time we heard a scientific defense. I says, well, it probably gave you the idea that we Christians don't have a scientific defense. I said, that's exactly right. We assumed that science was on our side. We had no idea it was the other way around. The other thing they said is the first time we've seen a gracious defense of the Christian faith, which is why I want to leave you with 1 Peter 3.15. Always be prepared to give good reasons for the hope within you, but with gentleness, respect, and a clear conscience. The unbelievers out there are waiting for us believers to respond with grace, humility, and wisdom.